What are the best hamstring exercises for muscle growth? According to the science, well, to understand the answer, we first need to understand the anatomy of the hamstrings. Welcome back, Dr. Milo Wolf here with Wolf Coaching, and today we're talking hamstrings and first, anatomy of the hamstrings. The hamstrings are actually composed of four muscle groups. There's the semimembranosus, the semitendinosus, and the biceps femoris, which can be further subdivided into the long head of the biceps femoris and the short head of the biceps femoris. That's four. The main roles of the hamstrings are knee flexion, like during a leg curl, and hip extension, like during an RDL. All four heads of the hamstrings I just mentioned contribute towards knee flexion, aka they get trained during a leg curl. However, only three of those heads contribute towards hip extension, like an RDL. So when you're doing something in an RDL or a good morning, only three quarters of your hamstrings are actually being trained if you just count the heads. The one head that isn't being trained effectively during an RDL is the short head of the biceps femoris. This muscle only crosses the knee joint and thus cannot contribute towards hip extension. So because of this, we need to make sure we include both hip extension work and knee flexion work within your program if we're trying to maximize the size of those hamstrings. The implication of the anatomy is that extending your knees like at the top of a leg curl would lengthen all the hamstrings. However, if we want to further lengthen the three heads that also do hip extension, we want your hips to be flexed, like during a seated leg curl, where your hips are flexed and on top of the rep, the knees are extended. That will stretch those three heads of the hamstrings that contribute towards hip extension more than if you just had your hips neutral. Another important note about the hamstrings is that because three of these heads are biarticular, we don't want exercises where the biarticular muscles are being shortened at one joint while being lengthened at another. We have data, for example, on the hamstrings in the squat or on the rectus femoris in the squat, both of which are biarticular muscles. What happens during an exercise, if a muscle is being lengthened at one joint and shortened at the other, it doesn't seem to produce much hypertrophy. And so when you're talking about biarticular muscles like the semitendinosus, the semimembranosus, and the biceps femoris long head, we want to make sure that when we're training it, we're either performing both of its functions at once, so it can go from maximal length to fully shortened, or we want to isolate one of its functions, so it can effectively shorten at one joint while its length isn't being changed at the other joint. For example, squatting for the hamstrings has been shown to cause next to no hamstring hypertrophy because of this phenomenon. One downstream consequence of this idea is that in your program, you will need to do dedicated hamstring training and quad training if you want to see robust growth in both muscle groups. If you were designing a very simple leg day, squatting wouldn't just cover it. You would need to do some sort of hamstring work thereafter, like a leg curl if you're trying to hit all four heads, or some sort of hip extension work if you're trying to train the three remaining heads. At this point, you might be like, okay, Milo, we get it. Like, we want both hip extension and knee flexion exercises, but there's a lot of them out there. Which ones should I pick? Luckily for you, and as I've mentioned in previous videos for other muscle groups, you can check those out in the description, there are a few criteria you can go by that the evidence has suggested are important to determine what exercises are best for muscle growth. And here's what they are. First, stability. If you're struggling with stability during an exercise, there's some evidence that that might reduce force output and thus hypertrophy. Generally, although you don't need to take this to the extreme, you want to pick exercises that are a bit more stable wherever possible. So if you're trying to do a single leg RDL and you find yourself struggling with balance and you sometimes fall over during the set, what have you, just keep in mind that falling over prematurely ends your set and doesn't push your hamstrings as close to true failure as they would have been with a more stable exercise. The second criteria is that we want to target a specific function of the target muscle. In this case, there are two functions, knee flexion and hip extension. In your program, because some of the hamstrings don't actually do hip extension, we want to make sure we have both hip extension and knee flexion to provide a well-rounded growth stimulus. Next, the target muscle should be the limiting factor. If, for example, you were doing RDLs for your hamstrings, but you weren't using straps and you had to end the set because you could no longer hold on to the bar, it was just slipping out of your hands, the hamstrings wouldn't be the limiting factor. It would be your grip. So whatever exercises we do perform, we want to make sure that the hamstrings are the limiting factor here. Next, we want the exercise to be stretch friendly. We have evidence, and this was actually something I looked at in my PhD, that the lengthened position or the stretch position in an exercise is pretty important for hypertrophy. And so whatever exercises we do pick need to have both the stretch position in the exercise 
and ideally also have plenty of tension in that position. So any good exercise for hamstring growth should place the hamstrings in that stretch position and should also be quite challenging in that stretch position. Bonus points if the exercise is also length and partial friendly. One of the techniques we've commonly investigated in the evidence, we now have five studies comparing length and partials to full range of motion for hypertrophy, is a lengthened partial, or essentially just doing a half rep in the lengthened position of an exercise. Across these five studies, four have found better hypertrophy when doing lengthened partials versus a full range of motion, and one has found no difference. And so, if an exercise lends itself well in terms of safety, resistance curve, etc., to lengthened partials, that makes it a better exercise for muscle growth. Now for a couple bonus points. These may not always be important, but they can still be something you want to look at when you're determining what exercises you should pick. The first one is, is the exercise time efficient? If you're someone who doesn't have much time available, this is gonna be much more relevant to you than some of the finer details about an exercise. If an exercise takes twice as long to do for the same number of sets, guess what? You shouldn't be doing that exercise. You should be picking the exercise that you can do the most hard sets with all else being equal, in the least amount of time possible. Generally, this will mean stack-loaded machines are your friend. This will mean dumbbells are your friend. And this will mean barbells generally aren't your friend. Barbells, you need to set up, you need to load the plates on both sides. It just takes a while. The second bonus point that may or may not be important depending on your circumstances is micro-loadability. Or essentially, what is the smallest increment in weight you can adjust the load by. If you're talking about something like cable ladder arrays, you'll only be able to progress in weight once every six months. And that's not because you're weak, maybe you are, but if you're watching this, you're very strong, trust me. But it's simply because the exercise isn't very micro-loadable. The next adjustable weight is simply, by percentages, a lot higher than the current weight. Whereas for something like a barbell exercise, where you have the ability to adjust by often as small as five pounds, or two and a half kilograms, the micro loadability is much greater. You could certainly get around this by simply doing more reps before adding weight, which is what we call a double progression, but it's a small factor to consider nevertheless. Now let's jump into what I think the best hamstring exercises for growth are. Quick reminder, we need both isolation and compound exercises. Otherwise the bicep femoris doesn't get much love. And so I'll be breaking down my top picks into compound exercises and isolation exercises. Without further ado, I think the best compound exercise for hamstring growth and one that's severely underdone is the Smith Machine Good Morning. First, it's a very stable exercise, as opposed to something like an RDL or a Good Morning where you have to worry about stabilizing the bar side to side and front to back and all that. With a Smith Machine, the bar is only going up and down. Stability is not an issue. Likewise, if you're performing the Smith Machine Good Morning properly, the hamstrings will very likely be the limiting factor. If you're keeping your knees relatively extending and simply pushing your hips back, not down, back, in order to maximize hip flexion while keeping knee flexion to a minimum, your hamstrings will be getting very lengthened. And so most of the stimulus should occur within your hamstrings as opposed to potentially your glutes or your adductors. As a side note, if you want to emphasize your glutes or your adductors, you might want to consider increasing the degree of knee flexion a little bit to overall be able to get a little bit deeper and get a little bit more hip flexion because that will then lengthen the glutes and adductors further. There's only so long your hamstrings can get, but if you allow them to shorten a little bit by bending your knees and letting your hips come down a little bit, that'll allow your glutes and adductors to receive more love. However, this is about hamstrings, so keep your knee flexion to a minimum, keep them relatively back, and just push your hips back towards the wall behind you. The Smith Machine Good Morning very much targets one of the functions of the hamstrings, which is hip extension. And finally, the Smith Machine Good Morning is very stretch friendly. Because of the way the movement is set up, the resistance gets higher and higher as you lengthen the hamstrings, which, as I mentioned earlier, is what we want. Additionally, by keeping the knees relatively extended and by just simply flexing the hips, you're able to get the hamstrings to a very considerable muscle length close to maximum muscle length, in fact. Finally, the Smith Machine Good Morning specifically is quite length and partial friendly. If you fail a length and partial, you can simply re-rack the weight. So safety-wise, it's a great option. However, you might be asking, why would I do length and partials on a good morning? And the answer there is, you might see more muscle growth. We have two studies in the hamstrings now, I'll mention the first one here. Keep in mind, this study hasn't been published in full yet, and it's simply a conference abstract. However, Here's what they did. They compared a full range of motion on the multi-hip machine with their knees pretty extended to a partial range of motion in the lengthened position on the multi-hip machine. Because their knees were relatively extended, just like I've been advising you to do 
and the good morning, the multi-hip with relatively extended knees is quite a comparable motion to a good morning. Now, back to the study. They measured hamstring hypertrophy and glute hypertrophy. One leg was doing lengthened partials, half reps in that lengthened position, and the other leg was doing full range of motion. Broadly speaking, they saw more hypertrophy of the glutes and the hamstrings when doing lengthened partials in the multi-hip exercise. So we have evidence directly in hamstrings on a very comparable exercise that lengthened partials are probably beneficial for hypertrophy. So when you combine this with the idea that there's about 20 or 25 studies comparing more lengthened training to more shortened training and measuring hypertrophy, it's fair to say that lengthened partials are a good idea for hamstring growth and Smith Machine Good Mornings are friendly towards lengthened partials. Now, let me give you a few respectable, honorable mentions. The barbell RDL with a deficit is equally as good, roughly, as the good morning. However, it loses out on a couple of points. One, because you are holding on to the bar, your grip may give out first, or maybe your upper traps give out first. There's a few more muscle groups that might be a limiting factor. And secondly, and to be, this is the main issue, setting up the deficit barbell RDL takes a lot of time. The same goes for the trap bar RDL with the deficit. First, you need to find the deficit and set it up. Then you need to load the bar side to side with usually a lot more weight than you'll be able to handle for the good morning. And so overall, it's substantially less time efficient than the good morning for in the end, no additional hypertrophy of the hamstrings. So when it comes to directly comparing the barbell RDL or trap bar RDL to a Smith machine good morning, they provide the same hamstring stimulus roughly, but one is more likely to be limited by the hamstrings, the good morning, and takes less time. And therefore for me, I think the good morning wins out, but it's a slim margin, especially if you don't have any time constraints. And now for the isolation exercise that is best for hamstring growth. Personally, I think the seated leg curl is the best exercise for hamstring growth or alternatively, the Nordic curl. However, the only issue I have with the Nordic curl is that you need to be very strong to do it. And no, I won't be providing B-roll for this one because I simply can't do them. The reason the seated leg curl is such an incredible exercise is because it lengthens the hamstring in all regards. First, you can get into deep knee extension where your hamstrings are being lengthened at the knee. However, the seated leg curl also flexes your hips, which further lengthens the three parts of the hamstrings that also cross at the hip. So compared to something like a lying leg curl, the seated leg curl lengthens those three heads that cross the hip more. And in fact, to take this up a notch, try leaning forward at the hips, not at the spine, like a cat stretching at the hips. And in fact, the idea that seated leg curls on account of the hips being flexed and the hamstrings being more lengthened, being better for growth than the lying leg curl is exactly what a study by my own colleagues a year ago found. They compared seated leg curls to lying leg curls and found better hypertrophy of all three of the hamstring heads that are more lengthened during the seated leg curl compared to the lying leg curl. If you don't want to do seated leg curls, consider the Nordic curl. While it doesn't have the benefit of flexing the hips and thus further lengthening the three heads of the hamstrings that cross the hip, it does have a pretty absurd resistance curve. As the hamstrings get more lengthened, the amount of force they have to produce to overcome gravity increases. And for hypertrophy, this is likely a good thing. Now that I've sung the praises of seated leg curls and potentially even Nordic curls, a lot. Let me give you a caveat as to why I think lying leg curls are actually an unsung hero in light of this evidence. While I still think that seated leg curls and Nordic curls should make up the majority of your hamstring isolation movements, maybe about 80%, lying leg curls may have their place. If you look at the evidence and this study by my own colleagues a bit more closely, what you'll find is that actually certain other knee flexors, like the gracilis muscle, might actually hypertrophy more from the lying leg curl. And it's for exactly the same reason why the hamstrings grew more in the seated leg curl. It's because it acts as a hip flexor, so the opposite of the hamstrings. And so when you're doing a lying leg curl, you're actually lengthening the gracilis more than during a seated leg curl. And so every now and then, maybe in about 20% of your training, including some lying leg curls, it won't increase your hamstring hypertrophy, but it will provide some additional hypertrophy to your gracilis muscle. That's the video. Try incorporating the Smith Machine Good Morning and the seated leg curl into your routine for hamstrings and let me know how it goes. If you like the video, please comment, like, subscribe, try to upgrade the setup, bring better videos for you, and any amount of support helps. Likewise, if you wanna see any other videos for other muscle groups breaking down the science behind the best exercises for each muscle group, leave a comment down below and I'll get to it. And with that, I'm out. Peace.